Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the uh, Center for Public Safety this morning. Uh, it's very fitting that we are here in this building today to deal with this, this issue that we're going to talk about. Uh, in September, uh, many of us, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lazar, myself, and many others in the room here spent quite a bit of time up here in this building uh, at the Emergency Operations Center down the hall. Uh, we could see, actually see Hurricane Florence coming on the maps and, and through the reports. It could be tracked, measured, and felt, and the relentless winds and the rains hounded us and flooded and tore apart our community. When it all stopped, the damage was very evident to us. Today we deal with a crisis that is not so evident to everyone, but in this building, dedicated to those in public safety who serve our community, we will seek to provide ourselves better for this, or better prepare ourselves for this crisis. Already there have been many successes, and I want to thank the Onslow County Board of Commissioners who met with the Jacksonville City Council months ago to talk about the impact of the opioid crisis and what it was having on our community. For Jacksonville, the impact of having the equivalent of eight police officers time involved in crisis was an eye opener. Never in my 30 years as a law enforcement officer would I have ever thought that police officers would have to administer Noxalone to an overdose patient and do it on a regular basis. This is not about the money or the time or the resources. It is about the lives, the families, and this community. Our community has made a significant step in creating the Crisis Center. Today, we take the time to create a map of services in our community and what may be missing. I want to welcome to all of you to this session, and I want to introduce some of the participants and, and have each of you introduce yourself. First, uh, I would like to recognize Mayor Pro Tem Lazar, Michael Lazar, who you'll be hearing from in just a moment. All right. Uh, also present, we have uh, Council Member Robert Warden. County Commissioners, we have Mark Price. We have recently re-elected State Representative George Cleveland. From U.S. Senator's offices, we have Janet Bradbury from Senator Burr's office. Uh, I haven't seen Adam Caldwell today. Uh, but we also have William Moore from uh, Congressman Jones's office with us today. And I want to thank Cindy Patain, who's not here today, but Vanessa and Vanessa Sapp for their commitment to the, to the effort that's been made. And I promise that as, a community, as community leaders, we will never forget your loss of your children. I wish also to introduce now Amanda Orbach of the Center for Health and Justice to introduce staff and others associated with the project. All right, so welcome. We are really excited to be here. My name is Amanda Auerbach. I am from the Center for Health and Justice at TASC. Uh, my colleague, Jack Charlier, is the executive director of our Center for Health and Justice. And I wanted to thank and recognize the mayor um, for your commitment and ongoing work in this area, um, for having us out here. Also, it's been uh, recognizing the work that Mayor Pro Tem Lazara and Chief Inero have done, um, and it's been a pleasure working with you so far to get us to this point. And I've spoken with some of you already. Um, I will be speaking with you again. That is not a threat. That is just, <laughs> I will be reaching out to many of you and talking to you more today to learn more about what you're doing in the community and how we can get this all together to save lives in the community to help counter the opioid epidemic. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jack. Okay. Thanks, Amanda, and good morning, everybody. Um, I will be brief, which always is the statement that you know I'm going to talk for like a long, long time. Um, so my name is Jack Charlie. I am the executive director of TASC Center for Health and Justice. Just a few opening comments. Uh, we've got a very good agenda for you today where we're going to be doing quite a bit of work together. Um, so this is not a presentation. I know we're set up in like classroom rows. It is not that. Um, we're going to be asking you questions, asking for your feedback and your opinion on the work that uh, we've already started. Um, 
Amanda, you took the time to recognize the elected uh, and appointed leadership uh, of where we are right now. I want to recognize Amanda for the work she's done. She's our project lead on this, and as she said, she's going to be interacting with lots of you over the next six months to get us uh, to the point where we can give you what it is that you need to know and to do next uh, in terms of addressing the opiate overdose uh, and overdose death epidemic that is in your area and in many areas in the country. So a little bit of background on task. It's actually very, very fitting that we're here. Um, I know in North Carolina you have task. Task's history in North Carolina is the same as our task. So um, in 1972, uh, what was happening in the United States? Who was coming back and from where? It's actually very relevant to this conversation. Who was coming back Vietnam from where? Vietnam vets. Vietnam vets were coming back. And what, what was one of the challenges they were facing uh, that's very much related to why we're here today? Heroin addiction, right, right, adjustment, right? We didn't kind of fully understand PTSD the way we do now, and certainly that impacts some folks, not everybody, but heroin addiction. And they were getting arrested across the United States and put in jails and prisons. But back then, um, and in 1972, under the Nixon administration, which gets kind of the, the flack for the war on drugs, but also started TASC. And TASC was the very first formal program in the United States whose job was to link the criminal justice system and the behavioral health system together. That's the founding of TAS, TAS North Carolina, TAS Illinois, TAS across the country, for the purposes of connecting Vietnam veterans who had heroin addiction to get them into treatment. And here we are now having a very, very similar conversation on a scale and scope that we've not seen before on any public health emergency in the United States, certainly higher than um, um, fatalities on the road, higher than shootings, right, higher than HIV AIDS. So we're kind of using the exact same tools that were launched then, and that is the history of TASC. And that we are sitting next to a military base uh, certainly is not lost on me because this is, again, the very population that TASC was formed for. The treatment capacity work that we're going to be doing with you then for us stems all the way back to 1972. Communities across the United States, when they have been ready to answer the question, of how do we do something different with folks who have addiction so they end up in treatment and get well and get better and restore their lives? That's treatment capacity, and that's been a question jurisdictions have been asking for a long time, and we at TASC have been working on it for a long time and work on it uh, every day as an operational agency also. So it's very, very familiar work with us, uh, and you guys should consider yourself kind of in a position of right place, right time, because of the leadership that you have and that you are a part of to say, we're doing this. We're going to take on this issue of treatment capacity, which is kind of like this dull phrase, right? Treatment capacity. But it's really about if we're going to respond to something in the numbers that we're seeing, do we have the ability to actually do it? Do we have the treatment available? Do we have the recovery community available? So I want to commend you for uh, being a community that is taking this on. Again, I wanted to harking back to our past of where we at TASC come from and the grounding, especially sitting in a, a military community like this. Uh, and then finally, um, I know it's not lost on me, Veterans Day is coming up on Sunday. I'm a veteran of the US Army and we'll be leading uh, some of our community's uh, veterans memorials uh, coming up uh, in just a few days. And so I just wanna acknowledge, it's very cool to be in a military community. I get to travel all over the country, but it's neat to be in a community uh, that has such a deep connection and deep ties to uh, our military, to the women and men who serve. So thank you for allowing us to be here again. Um, Amanda's kind of going to usher us through uh, this morning and then what comes next, uh, but just wanted to open up and say really, really exciting to be here, not because of the opioid epidemic, which is a sad, tragic thing, but because you as a community have said, we're going to answer this question of how do we make sure that everybody who overdoses, if they get to that point, has the services, the warm handoff, the connection, and into recovery that they need that our community can muster, just as your response across the street here has to the storm that you went through. Same level of resources, same level of commitment, and I commend you for that. Thank you. Amanda? All right. So I just want to pull up the agenda before we move on, just give everyone an idea of what the day is going to look like. I realize this is not in military time, which is a little out of the ordinary considering everything else I'm looking in, so you'll have to bear with me here. Um, okay, we're doing our, our welcomes. Uh, we're going to uh, go into a little bit of the scope of the local problem, what's going on here in a little bit more depth. 
Um, we will, Jack will be giving an overview of what our work here will look like over the next six months. So what do we mean when we say treatment capacity mapping? What are we mapping? What is, that, what is the work we're going to do? What are we going to give back to you all at the end of this? Um, we will have a break uh, around 10 o'clock. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we understand to be so far from those of you we've spoken to, uh, the overdose response in the community. I want to hear from all of you about what we didn't mention or what additional work is going on with what we did mention. Um, talk a little bit about the crisis center and then share with you what we've learned so far um, about the community and about the capacity. Um, after that, we're actually going to close out with uh, the chief will be leading a conversation about substance use disorder in the city and the county and give everyone a chance to engage um, in that. So without any further ado, Mayor Pro Tem Lazar, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the local problem. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. It's certainly an honor to be with you all this morning and I want to congratulate those that had a, a, uh, a good win last night. Representative Cleveland is, is with us today, so congratulations. Um, I want to add a few comments uh, in addition to the mayor. First of all, I want to thank the mayor for his support in this endeavor. Um, he has been extremely supportive in everything that we've tried to do, and that's extremely important in a community of our size. This effort is incredibly important. Uh, we're so pleased to, uh, to be able to have under construction a crisis center that can help this community to have a response to the opioid and mental health issue in our community. We're also pleased to have done this together with so many partners. I'm, I would like to personally thank all of them, and I know Mark Price is here today, and I want to thank you and the others that, that are able to join us. We've worked together for solutions to staff, maintain, and get people there who need help. But we know there are gaps between finding someone with a problem and assuring that they receive the proper treatment and then being and then becoming a productive member of our community. That's why we're here today to find and record the gaps which are extremely important. This is a great tribute to working together as a community. We knew this issue was affecting us and we certainly did not sit by. After learning that the crisis may have peaked in other areas, because even on a daily basis, this problem has deeply affected our community. For some around me, the wake up call came when Police Chief Mike Gennaro reported that the number of man hours that had been consumed by attention to our citizens who are in crisis. Think of other things that these police officers could have been doing at the time. Think of what might have happened uh, had they not been involved with these folks. But the issue was what to do next. And our community stepped up and created this crisis center that, that we are very excited about that should open up within the next few months. With the help of our legislative partners, significant grant writing and excellent staff work, the city and county agreed that this was a problem which together we could do something to help. More than a year ago, Attorney General Josh Stein convened a round table in this very room. It also served to deepen our resolve to get something done. Monday evening, Onslow County Commissioners accepted another grant to help prepare our community for this project. This effort at mapping is the result of the work of our city and others fine to identify these gaps. These partnerships are valuable. I'm really proud of our partnership with the Onslow County Commissioners. They quickly understood just how devastating this situation is. I'm proud of the North Carolina League of Municipalities in which I am the president this current year for helping us with a toolkit that communities can use to deal with this issue. I'm proud of our state which has provided funding to help with the crisis center. And I want to thank our U.S. Senators who have a keen interest in how they might help. This effort will perhaps reveal to all of us how federal resources can add to the mix. I mentioned earlier some news that the crisis may have crested. I hope that they're right. And even if that is correct, a trip down the mountain will certainly take a great long time. I'm confident many of you know the price of addiction. 
I certainly do. I know that there are resources that could be present elsewhere, but we must continue our effort to deal with this as a community. Let us not forget that recently, the Cast Light Health Report ranked Jacksonville as the 12th top city in America for opioid abuse in the U.S. It also reported that 8.2% of those who receive an opioid prescription abuse it. The demanding environments of military life and experiences of combat during which many veterans experience psychological distress can further complicate, be complicated by substance use and related disorders. Many service members face such critical issues as trauma, suicide, homelessness, and involvement with the criminal justice system. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration reports that about 18.5% of service members returning from Iraq or Afghanistan have post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. The same report says that 19.5% of service members returning report re experiencing a traumatic brain injury during deployment. Approximately 50% of returning service members who need treatment for mental health conditions seek it, but only slightly more than half who receive treatment receive adequate care. The Urban Institute estimates that 11.8% of veterans in North Carolina are uninsured. These stresses on military life can lead to prescription, drug, or opioid abuse, which ultimately leads to addiction. As reported to the CDC, Onslow County had 65 prescription drug, heroin, or opioid deaths in 2016. 63 deaths were reported in 2017. Thus far, there have been at least 86 prescription drug, heroin, or opioid deaths in 2018, and we still have a couple months left. Currently, a comprehensive crisis con continuum is not available throughout Onslow and Carteret counties as needed. There is no local facility-based detox or crisis center. Now, law enforcement must rely on mobile crisis management, the hospitals or the jails, for immediate services for persons addicted to opioids whom are in crisis. The opening of the crisis center in 2019 is just one step. As our community continues to face the challenges presented by the opioid epidemic, data that we obtain from this project will allow us to develop comprehensive approaches to the reduction of opioid misuse, abuse, and overdose deaths. The Jacksonville Police Department has partnered with the Onslow County EMS on a quick response team program. This program will address citizens' focus on providing treatment after an overdose. The immediate follow-up after an overdose is a key step in helping people finally get into treatment. When users are thought to be more open to accepting help at that moment, this program is one step in addressing the plague that affects our community. I'm particularly excited about a diversion program to give non-criminal options to law enforcement who see this on the front lines. Police Chief Mike Canero says nearly 300 people have been identified who could have benefited from this program already. Pre-arrest diversion provides victims with a pathway to get help. It ensures the pathways are followed and it uses this intercept to keep people who need treatment out of jail and into programs that can help. It uses case management to ensure that, path, that the pathways are being followed, and it works. Communities with pre-arrest diversions report, report lower crime, improved public safety, both perceived and real, fewer cases with drug abuse, and better outcomes when law enforcement encounter victims. Communities also report a significant improvement in relationships between law enforcement and, and the public health and behavioral health. 
Social service agencies report lower involvement in foster care issues and other crises that can separate families and stress thin resources. This project will give us a vision of how we as a community can ensure that every person battling addiction has the best opportunity to survive. It will provide a roadmap for those who are battling addiction to improve the lives of the individual, their families, and the community. These deaths in our community are completely preventable. I want to restate that. The, these deaths in our community are completely preventable. I'm proud that we have done what we have done as a community of partners. I'm proud that we have stood strong in our conviction to share resources and work collaborative, collaboratively to deal with this problem. I'm sad about the horrific effect addiction has had in our community. I'm sad when I consider the lives lost, the human potential of good that has been lost, and I cringe at the cost of all this. This is our time to do this right, and today is a great start. I hope we can look back on this time from a space in the future where there are no deaths in our community from opioid overdose. I want to thank each of you for being here on this very important issue, and thank you for being here this morning.